welcome back to room 237 and I'm back with another 80 slasher film and not only is this another 80 slasher but it is another off of the uh, a video nasties list this this is off section 2 of the video nasties which was less obscene but not prosecuted still seized and it's one I've heard of and has actually been kind of hard to find Lately, I I found it unexpectedly today for very cheap, so of course I snagged it. And it's, I've seen 1982 and 83. I think 82 is when it was made, though it wasn't officially released until 83. And it is unhinged. Now this is the DVD put out by uh, Indie DVD. Which I'm guessing was a while ago because I found this, uh, I bought this um, used and there was still a coupon in here for a free DVD that expires in June of 2004. So I'm guessing this DVD is pretty old. Now, it was directed by Don Gronquist who also wrote the film along, along with Reagan Ramsey and... <clears throat> it stars uh, Laurel Munson, Janet Penner, who is credited as J.E. Penner, Sarah Ansley, and music by Jonathan Newton, who Newton all would go on to do the music for Shadow Play with D. Wallace. And, yeah. <laughs> thing about this movie is this is yet another entry of the video nasties where you kind of wonder why it was even on there i mean yes the the ending scene that there is a death that has like 20 or 30 stabs in it but after watching the film and taking a good look at the cover and all the stills and how you know this movie really, no pun intended, hinged on the fact that it was video nasty. It's really not that bloody or violent, really. I mean, the, the body count is very low. One of the... Um, it is one of those slashers where it's mostly character and story up until the final act, and then that's when all the kills are pushed in. It... <clears throat> It's not that it's boring or anything, or that it's a very slow slasher. I mean, there's enough psychological uh, elements throughout, and it does have a great setting and a good atmosphere. It was filmed, filmed to take place in the Pacific Northwest, uh, specifically the Portland, Oregon area, which it does a good job at really uh, utilizing that, even though it has a very limited uh, setting, which is this big mansion, but outside it's, you know, all woods, constantly overcast or rainy, but it, it does have a good atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> apparently according to this, it was banned in 85 and that's when it was uh, uh, successfully banned. It's not like slashers like Death Valley or Sweet Sixteen or ones like that where they're just slow. And in fact, a lot of this movie reminded me of, even though many critics and scholars would go on to say and draw comparisons to Psycho, it actually reminded me a lot of uh, a Great Expectations <laughs> with uh, the otherly woman in this film really reminded me of uh, uh, Mrs. Havisham from uh, Great Expectations, which, which the only movie of that I've seen is the Robert De Niro one, but I've read the book. There really isn't too much to say about it. I mean, one, I am kind of glad I had this older DVD because when it does come to early 80s slashers, I like to not have them super remastered or cleaned up. I mean, this looks like it was ripped straight from a VHS. Just like my copy of uh, Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. 
is looks super degraded and grainy and cracky. And I love that. I I love uh to me I feel like that's the only way to really watch a slasher. I don't want to watch one that's really super clear and 4K uh, uh ultra restored. I don't know why people need to have that in everything. Granted, that being said, some of the nighttime scenes are a bit hard to see what's going on. But it's I I thought that was fine. The acting is I don't even want to say bad or abysmal because it's all bad for the same way. Our three main characters are incredibly dry. They're very uh, wooden. As in, like, they have... There's no inflection in their voice. There's no facial expression. They might go up a bit, like, when they ask a question, but it's always just like, well, I don't know. I keep hearing a weird noise. I'm not sure what that is. And actually, I should say two main characters, because one of them is pretty much bedridden and not seen throughout most of the film. And just because of the buildup uh, of the killer and the fact that it's these young women staying in a very nice big house, it it does also remind me of uh, The Unseen, which I have done a review of. It's another slasher film. Only this doesn't have the acting that The Unseen does. The, the Unseen has some very well done character acting. But the story, I mean, you have three friends. You have Terry, Nancy, and Gloria. They're on their way somewhere. They hear a radio broadcast about a, a missing young girls out in the surrounding woods. They get in a car accident. When they wake up, they're in this huge mansion that they're pretty much unlived in. There's, there's not much for lighting. It's really just this... Uh, of elderly woman, her adult daughter Marion, played by uh, Janet Penner, which Janet Penner is the, as far as acting goes, she saves the film. Uh, the actress who plays the mother, the elderly woman, she does a good job too, but I would say Janet Penner playing Marion really does help pull this film along where everyone else is just so dry and you know barely there and they're just kind of letting them stay until some help comes but remind what reminds me of great expectations is that the elderly woman and we find out more and more throughout the film she is a uh, a maniacally a, a misandrist. She hates men. We find out later why. It's not quite the same as Great Expectations, but to the point where she doesn't allow any men in the house or her daughter to really have any kind of relationship or any man over. The only man that ever is present is the groundskeeper, who I think works for several houses in the area, played by John Morrison, whose character's name is Norman Barnes. That's a little on the nose. And he also, you know, for the short scenes he was in, I think that acting was decent as well. <clears throat> also, what's very psycho-ish is the fact that the killer, who we don't see until the end, very much like the unseen. We constantly hear breathing, or we see an eyeball looking through a peephole, you know, all dark except for just the iris being lit up, you know, up close of an eye, watching these girls as they talk or as they shower. Terry is really our main character, and she's the one that hears the the breathing or see something outside and yeah over the course of the film we get three deaths really so yeah it is a low body count slasher it really doesn't deserve 
you know, this, <laughs> of this kind of marketing. I mean, you can put that as a video nasty, but don't try to make it look like it's to the level of, you know, the higher up ones. I mean, don't go in the woods can have uh, this kind of marketing. And it does go at a very leisurely pace, but <clears throat> it's not that I ever found it boring. It does feel more like a psychological uh, melodrama. And I say melodrama just because of like, the setting, the types of characters that Marion and her mother are. It is like this twisted Great Expectations type feel. Uh, I will say I did not see the end coming. <laughs> it, it, there is a twist ending. So much so that I can't even say what scholars have really noted about this film as far as themes. Because if I do say it, it was noted for these things, it will give away the twist. So I guess I'll get into spoilers now. I mean, it's 1982, but I will say this movie is a, a gem. I will say it's a gem. Cause it's not a slasher that most people have seen. Like, say, The Burning, or Maniac, My Bloody Valentine, or anything like that. It is an underseen gem. Now, I don't mean gem, like, rush out and see it immediately. But it is interesting enough, and uh, I am glad to have it in my collection. It's just not one of my favorite slashers. I will say of the ones that are incredibly slow, with very low body counts, where all the kills are pushed to the third act, I will say it is one of the better ones. Also, I do want to mention, before spoilers, uh, the score I really enjoyed. Along with... Uh, Janet Penner's performance and the setting and atmosphere, the score is one of the saving graces of this film. It <clears throat> it has this like electro synth score with like these very sharp drum beats throughout it. But while some parts do sound like good slasher uh like a good slasher score. A lot of it, like when we see the eye looking through the peephole, it is kind of like sound effects rather than actual notes. You know, like uh, synth screech notes or something like that, or stings. So it sounds kind of experimental, but when there actually is like an actual piece of music, it is very catchy. It does fit. And it's usually when a character is uh, running through the woods or being chased or when it's more softer but still synthy, like walking through the darkened hallways. I thought the music really fit and was one of the best parts of this movie. So with that, I'm going to get into spoilers. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to put the spoiler thing up because it's not like it's a mystery. It's just one twist ending. So... If I heard this correctly, because where this is an older DVD that's not super remastered, uh, yes, the it was kind of grainy, the the video, but the audio was still kind of muffled and scratchy. Or whether they're inside, like the if they're in like the foyer or the big hallway of the house, it's very echoey, which that helps the atmosphere too. But even during general conversation, it, it's kind of hard to make out sometimes what they're saying. But I think <clears throat> Janet tells a story about her father. I think getting involved with a young child or something, or, uh, something to that effect, her mother found out. And then that's what created her crazy misandry. Hatred of men would not allow men anywhere near her. They, you know, she picked up Marion and moved out to that house away from everyone to essentially isolate herself away from men. People especially, or people in general, 
men especially. And Marion is the one that deals with Norman, the groundskeeper. But, uh, <clears throat> eventually, like, this is our first victim, and this happens around the halfway point where Nancy loses the coin toss to run to uh, the nearby village through the woods where supposedly all these girls have gone missing. She comes to this one clearing and the killer, whose face we don't see, kills her with a scythe. I mean, it's a pretty good scene. I mean, it goes into like very shaky uh, close-ups and... This movie was made for $100,000, which I will say, for a hundred grand as a budget, it is pretty well made. I mean, it it looks cheap, but it doesn't look like a micro-budget film. So, they did utilize their budget very well. <clears throat> but, like, when Nancy's being killed, it is these very shaky close-ups and crazy angles of the struggle... At one point, she catches the scythe. She's holding the blade. But, of course, she's killed. It's not an overly bloody scene. Like, we don't see blood going everywhere. It's just kind of what's already on her. And actually, I, I think the scene ends at this angle. But So, that's the first victim. And... <clears throat> We do see a bit of the killer after that, which is like this bearded, dirty kind of guy. We do know there's a man outside earlier on because Terry does see a man going into the barn or the shed at night. When she tries to go out there the next day, Marion stops her saying it's just an unsafe structure. So we know there is a man around that's not Norman. Mixed with the breathing, I thought it was going to be Marion has like this secret male lover that comes over and kills them or, or whatever. But, and, and that leads to the, well, no, I'll save it for after. Eventually she goes into Gloria's room, which Gloria is able to get up out of bed now. Talked about leaving. And then this is probably my favorite kill. Just because of how it's shot. The way the music is. We see the eye looking through the peephole. At them talking. Then that night. The killer comes in. Walks up to Gloria. And just. Hits her in the head with a hatchet. Which. The way it's done. Like we don't see the actual hatchet coming down. It's done by what I call the Savini effect, which how Savini will kind of show that there's substance there to make it be more impactful. In this case, and how you do it off screen, is it showed her hand on the blanket, and when you hear the, you see her kind of wrench and, and grab the blanket, blood goes everywhere. It just... This darkened room, the way the lightning uh, illuminates this girl with a hatchet in her head with blood all over the sheets with the music as it just slowly pans back. Probably my favorite shot and kill of the whole movie. <clears throat> Terry goes out in the shed and sees us full of dead bodies, full of bloody dead bodies. Sees Gloria and... Uh, Nancy in there. Even finds a jar of eyeballs that gets knocked over. And then that's when she's chased by our killer. Who, as I said before, is this like bearded, dirty, heavier set guy that we saw peeking in through a window at one point. A chase ensues and she runs into this room where she found... There's a room in which she found a belt. That has a, a pistol. Grabs the pistol. Shoots him. And then that's when Marion comes in. And now by this point we're already told. That Marion has a brother named Carl. Who lives in secret. Outside. Not allowed in the house. Because he's a male. 
but she still worries about him, tries to take care of him, but he's harmless. That's what we hear. So, Marion, grieving over Carl, as it, why did you do that? That he tried to kill me. No, he was playing with you. That's how he plays. He has the mind of a five-year-old. She's like, go look out in the barn if you think that's playing. And this is where we get the twist that I did not see coming. And what I saved for spoilers was scholars and critics have noted this being one of the earlier films to really deal with uh, uh, gender dysphoria and repression. Because when Marion looks up, it, this was actually pretty creepy how it's done. We see her mouth moving, but then through, there's like a, uh, what's the thing I'm looking for? Uh, um, ADR over it, uh, a male's voice. There's a male's voice coming out of her saying, Carl didn't have anything to do with that. That's all me. Those are my victims. So Marion was the killer the whole time. And Marion grabs the machete out of the sheath that was in the belt that the pistol was in. There's a struggle. And Terry pulls on her shirt and we see chest hair. Revealing she's a man. Also, the lead character gets killed. This is one of those few slashers where all the main characters are killed and the killer is fine, essentially. And as Marion is stabbing Terry over and over and over, I mean, all like 30 times going on her own or his own uh, tirade about his hatred of women and how he hates women, yet he he's forced to adopt the gender himself because of his mother you know his mother's supreme hatred of men has made him become a woman become marion which i think is why carl was outcast because he was already old enough to just be cast out whereas i'm guessing marion was younger it could grow as a girl or uh into a woman <clears throat> so, for has the same hatred of women that, you know, the same misogyny as his mother's misandry, yet he's forced to live as one, which is a very interesting aspect. I mean, you can almost make a whole movie out of that instead of just saving it for a twist, even though it works as a twist as well. So it's noted as being one of the first, you know, Movies to really kind of look at that kind of gender dysphoria. In, or I guess at least in that way. And it ends with the mother calling down. Saying like, Marion, do you have one of your men down there with you? And back to Marion's female voice says, no mother. Then it ends. So, I mean, I, I didn't see the twist coming. So, I mean, that's a success. It's also a twist that works. It doesn't seem random. Ties into the plot, you know, well enough, you know, and, and we have seen that this mother is crazy enough and hates men enough to make his own son become a woman. It, it's not like sleepaway camp where it's kind of just weird and random, uh, almost just for like a shocking gotcha. I think this fits into the plot more. So I didn't see that coming. <clears throat> I was surprised to see that the final girl does get killed. And it, it helps save the film. It, if it didn't have that, or if it didn't have as good a music as it does, this easily could have been another low body count, slow paced, slasher movie that was forgotten for a reason or another one that happened to be a video nasty but poorly live up to it or not live up to it at all but it has plenty going for it. i mean i love the setting and the atmosphere i love the score 
while most of the acting is very uh, wooden and dry, uh, Janet Penner, who plays Marion, I thought really helped carry the film with her performance. As does the scenes with her mother and with John Morrison as Norman Barnes. Uh, it it was a slower paced kind of melodrama, but uh, I thought it was interesting enough. Like the whole backstory told by Marion help helped keep it going. Also, the setting and atmosphere helped with that slower pace. <clears throat> uh, it did remind me of the unseen and great expectations. The kills, although very few. And not very bloody. I thought we're still done well enough. And the twist, I definitely did see coming. And I thought it was handled well. It was handled in a creepy, you know, a, a creepy way. Like just with that uh, voiceover dubbed over the actress. <clears throat> it, it was handled the best way I thought they could. Unfortunately, the angle they went with with the twist could have been interesting enough for a whole movie. But, yeah, not one of my favorite slashers. Not one of my favorite video nasties. Certainly not one of my favorite slashers from 82 or 83. But, I certainly liked it enough to say this is a hidden gem. This is a forgotten gem. This is one where, if you can deal with the pacing... It does pay off. It, And, I mean, it's only 80 minutes. So, I mean, it's not like you're totally losing a lot of time. But, yeah, I, I kind of figured they were going to use all of this for, like, the marketing to help sell it. And that it was going to be another one of those, you know, low body count, slower pace slashers or video nasties that didn't live up to its uh, uh, reputation. But I ended up enjoying it. And the twist ending was worth it. So that's 1982-83. I'm just going to say 82. 1982's Unhinged. I do have a few more 80s slashers and video nasties to get to. I also just picked up uh, a couple more Gaspar Noe films, which I'll be getting to. So stay tuned for those, and uh, thank you for watching. Oh, oh.